This is PBS. About Your House with Bob Yap was partially underwritten by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. In past places and future spaces, from main streets to back roads, we're helping Americans bring preservation home. The National Trust for Historic Preservation. Welcome to today's program, and is this a drop-dead 1880s restored house or what? I just love them, and you know what? A lot of people do, but that's not what the show's about today. It's about reproduction houses. Now, the issue a lot of times is people love the charm of old houses, but they don't want to go through the nightmare of renovating, and I've been through so many renovations, sometimes I can understand that. And you know, interior spaces in old houses sometimes aren't real conducive to the way we live today, so what's the option? Well, take a look at this house. This was built a hundred years later in the 1980s. People drive by it and they think it's an old house. It's really high quality infill. It's called a reproduction house. Now we're going to talk today about how you can get a lot to build one, how you design one, how you find maybe an architect if you want to, and we're going to go look at a whole bunch of different houses that were done by other people, so it should be a lot of fun. But one of the big issues is in the last 20, 30 years, there have been a lot of builders that have tried to make their houses look historic. And let me tell you, it's been an architectural disaster. Well, all right, now, it's one thing to say that all of these designs that are supposed to be period on the cornfield developments are not accurate and they're actually a disaster. But what I really need to do here is show you why. And that's the fun part of it. I want to start on what's supposed to be a Greek revival. It's barely anything close to a Greek revival. Look at the three-car garage plopped onto the side compared to this historic house. The symmetry is way off. And the little gable on the historic house, the big gable actually, over the columns compared to the little gable in the middle on the roof on the other one, just doesn't pull off the Greek revival look at all. And the porches are a big part of this. Here's this little tiny porch. Looks more Italianate than it does Greek revival. Square columns sitting on top of a concrete slab. It just doesn't work at all. And look at this porch. Huge fluted columns, nice bases with recessed panels. It is a beautiful porch and it does a nice job. Now windows, these have fake divided lights or muttons for the panes and they're really kind of short and squat. Now look at this historic house, tall and narrow, stone lentils. It has six panes over nine. That's very much a historic pattern for a Greek Revival house. Windows are a big part of the look of any house. Now here's a Queen Anne in the upper left and a Queen Anne historic one in the bottom. Really, the new one is a two-story that has some things plopped on it to try to make it look Queen Anne. It's not. The railings are too high. The spindles are separated too much. It has little tiny dinky columns that are square. It doesn't work very well at all. Now, look at this porch. Nice, beautiful Tuscan columns on top of stone bases with kind of a whoop de dude railing. Nice design in there. And that's really what Queen Anne's are about, after all, is detail work because everybody was into this high fashion and everything during the Queen Anne era. And that new house didn't have any of the type of thing you're seeing here, that dart and egg and all the moldings. And look at the spire on top of the tower of the turret. Squat, little tiny squat windows, and look at this. Nice tall spire, nice window massing, lots of detail work. That's what it's all about. So I just can't understand why builders insist on calling houses something that they're really not. I mean, they're just like mishmashes. It's awful. Why can't builders build stuff that's more accurate? I mean, it doesn't cost any more. Can they do it? You bet they can do it. In fact, let's go take a look at one in Pennsylvania that was done very nicely. Well, now that we've looked at all those nasty cornfield developments and all those houses they call reproductions, which are really not, of course, the most redeeming architectural feature in those houses seems to be the three-car garage on the front, which blows my mind. I wanted to bring you out to Pennsylvania. Now, we're out in rural Pennsylvania, just outside Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we are in front of a custom-built Second Empire reproduction. And I wanted to start out the good ones here because this is a very good one. Now, this is Lynette Perung over here. Hi, Lynette. Good to Hello, see Bob. you. 
And this is Roy Penner. Hi, Roy, Bob. good to see you too. And you and, and your husband Dennis and Roy have been conspiring to build this fabulous house. It really is well done. I'm totally impressed. When I drove up the driveway, you sent me pictures, but driving up the driveway really brought it home. Beautiful Second Empire, mansard roof. You can have great cornices on the house. It's just the massing and the detailing. And, well, take a look at the, this drawing here, this uh, one of your blueprint drawings, with the arched windows and the brick detailing here. The dormers, too, are very, very typical of that period of time. And I just, I, I, you just don't see this kind of care for detail work. Now, why did you pick Second Empire? Well, it was the classic style that really incorporated the most best use of space for us. Yeah, now, yeah. is that you talking? No. <laughs> That's my husband. But Dennis was really enthralled with the style yes, from the very was. beginning. And, and you're, you're with the program now, too, huh? Oh, yes. And I'm, I'm a real proponent of using all the space you can. I see a little bit in the walls, and I think, well, maybe I'll put something else there. Right. Well, mansard roofs are so common in France because, you know, we, and we were talking about this before, they didn't, no property tax within the roof, but they could rent the space out and right. get in. Now, some of the other things I like about it are you have lots of porches and balcony. This is off the master bedroom, Roy? Yes, it is. It is also accessed off the second floor hallway, so other people in the house can use it, but there is a door directly from the master bedroom suite. That's great. Now, you have two fireplaces. Right. And some, you're doing all kinds of specialized heating and air conditioning systems, HVA systems you're doing. Yeah, we're um, installing hot water radiant floors, um, a seven zone system with high velocity air conditioning that is also functioning for air cleaning, humidification, dehumidification. Uh, it will circulate the air both winter and summer. Great system. Now back to this drawing, what, the whole house is brick. And, I, and that is also very typical of that period, of course. And as I've been driving around in Pittsburgh and outside the area, brick seems to be a fairly predominant building material out here, more so than back in the Midwest where we live. Um, but you're also going to do all this brick detailing over the tops of the windows, and that will really punch them out. Mm -hmm. It's part of the, the vocabulary of this style are these uh, window heads, and uh, we use the brick to create that uh, piece of the style. Is this one of the more unique houses that you've uh, helped design as an architect? It is a unique house, although we've done several uh, very unique homes. Well, don't uh, let him get away with that, Lynette. <laughs> <laughs> all right, how many square feet about? Oh, about a little over 3,200. 3,200, and you were saying with all the, the every systems, the septic, getting the well finished off and everything up in the high 300 range. Right. Actually, for that kind of square footage for a brand new house that is is so careful in the detailing of, of you know, reproducing that whole Second Empire. I think that's really pretty good. You've done a great job, both of you. Thank you so much for letting Thank us come you. out and take a peek. Thank you, Bob. Roy, my pleasure. Hi guys, how are you? Good. Well, you know, that was the right way to build a reproduction house out in the country. But what if you want to live inside the city? You know, Central City historic neighborhoods are actually a very good way to find a lot to build your house on. Now, you could go and look in a neighborhood like this with lots of boarded up houses and trash in the vacant lots, the gap tooth lots. But actually, in a neighborhood like this, with people walking around, you want to look at how people feel about it. Like these folks right here. Hi, guys. Hi, Bob. They actually like being in this neighborhood. And you have to look around. Are there lots of houses being renovated? Maybe not all of them. There's a few abandoned ones here and there. But are people doing things? That's a very important part of what's going on. They're out walking their dogs, walking the kids down the street. And are there things going on on either side of the lot that you might be looking at? Like this particular lot shows a house that's being renovated next door and lots of good things going on. You just have to take a minute and decide what you want. Take a look at the values in the neighborhood too. Are they on the rise? That's an important feature that you should look for in any Central City historic neighborhood. Now once you see a lot or two that you think you like, how do you know who owns it or how are you going to buy it? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting, but the recorder's office is something that I, I have some thoughts on, actually.
You little puke. <laughs> the daughter of Satan, the county recorder. Oh my God, she's got a cigar. I don't believe it. Ah! Uh -huh. Are you all right? Oh, Pat. Oh, Pat. Okay. I was having this terrible nightmare. I mean, it was really ugly, and it has nothing to do with reality. This is Pat Veranda, and she is the county recorder in Rock Island County, Illinois. Thank you for waking me up because it was really bad. Oh, you're welcome. I know you're really busy, but uh, I'm going to show everybody all this stuff. So, what do you think? Okay. Well, I have a few things to do. I'll be right in the other room if you need me. Just give me a holler. I appreciate it. Thanks, Pat. Pat's great. And in your county recorder's office, you're probably going to find exactly the same thing. Now, what is this all about? If you're trying to find that lot that we were talking about, what you need to do are a couple things first. Try to find what the address on either side of the lot is. You know, the houses have the address, because you need to narrowly define where that lot is. Then I suggest you come right into the recorder's office, and you come to these books. This one happens to be what they call a supervisor assessment map, and it shows all the neighborhoods and the plats and the plat names and the lot sizes and how everything's laid out. In fact, it's interesting because uh, two lots that we combined for a property, our, our renovation house for the show, it shows that they've made a notation in here that it's all one lot now. So you find a lot of good information. So what else can you find out at the recorder's office? Well, you can get the legal description of the property, the lot size, who the current owner is, and their last known address. Sometimes people move and don't tell the recorder's office where they went. But most of the time, you can get that address, and that will get you to finding the owner, even if you have to go down to the library and look up in the city directory. But sometimes that will give you the phone number, call them up, and negotiate with them. Now remember that a lot of times lots aren't worth exactly what they're assessed for because houses were torn down and they're just sitting there and people are really anxious to get rid of them. So you might have a good deal from that perspective. Once you get some of this information together, what you're going to be able to do is go over to this card file over here and pull out a card. And these cards have who owns the property, how many mortgages, all the different stuff that you can do on your own without bugging folks down here. And it's kind of fun to go through this process. Now, another thing that you can do if you're looking for a lot is to go to your county tax auction. And this is a catalog for a tax auction here in Rock Island County. And they have them every so often. What happens is that Properties don't get their taxes paid, and the county takes the property over, and then they sell it to a third-party entity, who then, in turn, by law, has to have an auction. It's just like an antique auction. You go in there, and you actually bid on things. They usually have like a minimum of $250 or whatever. And with the catalog, of course, you go and look at the lots, and you want to make sure of any lot that you're doing that it's legal to build on it. What does that mean? Well, they call it setbacks. Now that means how far from the lot lines on either side of the lot or from the alley behind or the street in front. Some lots are not buildable, so you need to check that out with your local zoning department. But once you've got that checked out, either negotiate by finding out who owns a vacant lot or go to one of these tax auctions. They're a lot of fun. Now you've found where you want to build your house. So what's the next step? Well, it's figuring out what you want your house to look like, what historic design you want to go for. How do you do that? Well, you can start off with plan books. Now here's one that is put out by a magazine that does historic preservation. Very accurate, nice stuff. And the plans are going to run for eight sets of plans, somewhere between $250 and $600. Now here's another option. This one comes off the shelves at the grocery store. And, you know, it's kind of a hit and miss deal. I mean, they have a Victorian supposedly on the front of this, which has Italianate and all different kinds of things, shingle on it. It's really not a Queen Anne or a Victorian. Uh, but, you know, you can get some historic house plans out of these that might work, but I'm not a big fan of them. And they're double the price. They're going to run $400 to $800, and that's pretty expensive. There's another alternative because I think some of this gets very confusing, and that is to get comfortable. And part of that has to do with taking off your shoes, getting your socks off, and you're going to get in your truck or your car. And what you're going to do is you're going to take your camera and you're going to go take pictures. That's fun. Now, to do this, I like to do it with a good pair of sandals. That's an important part of this for me. We'll get in the truck and we'll go around the neighborhood and we'll actually look for houses that we like and we'll take pictures of them. So let's go do it. Well, of course, camera and comfortable shoes, all important when you're tooling around the neighborhood. 
looking for accurate historic house styles, but it's also critical that you have really good tune. Oh, yeah, I'm loving it. Let's do it. Well, you know, looking for the right house is the style that you like. It can be kind of tough sometimes. Oh, but wait a minute. There is a very cool Queen Anne. In fact, they've even faux painted the columns on the front porch. Oh, man, where's the camera? This is really cool. Now, this is a second empire style house. It even has the original slate roof. It looks like it needs a little bit of renovation, but I'll tell you what, it's got a classical porch put on later, but boy, that's a neat house. I like that one a lot. Ah, oh, get a shot of that. There we go. Let's get a couple. Yeah. Oh, it's great. You gotta love this one, huh? Oh, far out. Bring the camera up here, Dave. This is great. This is a craftsman style house, one of my favorite in the whole world. And it just so happens that I used to own this a long, long time ago when we renovated it years ago. And it's great. But here's the key to this. Once you find the style that you like, you got to take some pictures of it. And that's what I'm going to be doing here. Now, you can take them from the sidewalk or the street legally, but you should get the owner's permission. Now, why would you do this? Well, you take the pictures. One option is to go to a drafts person, and they can come out to the house, get permission from the owner. They'll go in, measure everything up, and they'll give you drawings of how that house is. Now, if you want to tweak it a little bit on the inside to make it livable for your lifestyle, you can do that as well. Now, the price range is going to be $800, maybe as high as $5,000, but you're going to average somewhere between $1,500 and $2,000 for all the sets of prints and everything that you need. It's going to be great. Now, there's another way that you can get your house designed. Well, my favorite way to get a reproduction house design is actually to use an architect, and you should consider it as well. Let me introduce you to Jeff Dismer, and Jeff is with Gear Dismer Architects in Rock Island, Illinois, in my neck of the woods. And Jeff's on the Historic Preservation Commission. He does historic preservation type things, but he does commercial and lots of residential too, mm -hmm. and reproduction houses of all different kinds. Mm -hmm. Now, Jeff, let me ask you a question. Somebody wants to get a reproduction house built what would be the reason to come to you? Well, the reason to come to an architect is architects know about history, historic houses. You study that? We study that in schooling. We, we continue to uh, study that and, and do that type of research. And what we do is we, we take the interest of a client, take a clue from them, and we can incorporate styles, we can incorporate feelings, uh, today's lifestyles into that design. Well, and wouldn't that really be the whole purpose of this, is that people like the charm and the look and the feel of, uh, of the historic design, but they still have to live in it. It's not a museum. Well, that's it, exactly. I mean, people are a much more comfortable style of living today. And just because you have a house that, that uh, references back to history doesn't mean that it, that it is informal or it is difficult living. Uh, so we really gear it toward a lifestyle. We incorporate uh, sort of a feeling or an atmosphere that they like to see in a house. Well, you might be looking at a master bedroom suite. Uh, you might be looking at second floor laundry. That's it, exactly. Yeah. Or, or today, today's living, as far as a kitchen open to the living room, is a very popular thing that didn't exist in, in you know, the late 1800s, but it's something we can incorporate into a house. And it doesn't there. have to have that narrow, cheesy, colonial pine that's or mahogany right. woodwork. No, we never case. use that. So <laughs> we can't do that. You so. know what I mean? <laughs> sure, exactly. Well, well, that's interesting. So you take the people through the, through the process, step by step, try to understand how they live? Is mm -hmm. that what is that what it is? Well, that's, that's a big part of it because everybody lives a little bit differently, and that's a big part of what we do, do in the design and laying out the flow of the house is how people live, how many bedrooms they need, what kind of uh, spaces open into others. 
No, they can they can come to you with pictures of houses they've taken, or they can find an old book like this. Yeah, these are great. Oh, this is fabulous. I mean, it has cottages in it. Old, uh, you know, I mean, this book dates back to the period when they were being built from exactly. from East Lake to Second Empire. I mean, it's amazing. Well, and what we can do, and and quite often do, is somebody comes to us with either a book like this or a photograph. In fact, one person, one couple came to us with an oil painting of a very pastoral house in a setting and said, this is the house I want. And we worked from the outside in, created that house, right. built their program and their lifestyle into the house, and they got exactly what they're looking for. That's amazing. Now, here is a photograph of a really a somewhat simple little farmhouse. What, what was the uh, end result of this particular Well, this, this uh, photo was actually taken, taken moments before demolition. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, farmhouse that was built in the 1880s... Which, uh, by the way, is on a lot right in the city. Yeah. Right in the middle of the city, yeah. but it was uh, devoured by termites and ah. condemned by the building department. Yep, had to come down. So the, the building the house had to come down. And what we did, the couple loved the house. I mean, they loved everything about it from, from the look, but there was a number of things that they wanted to improve upon as far as the way they lived. The livability for today. Exactly. Okay. So okay. we recreated that house, we made some improvements, to the way they live and actually incorporated pieces of the house. There's an oval window that's located above the entry door. I know, and you can see it right great. here. It's a beautiful window. And then you put a copper roof on it, that's which is it exactly. just gorgeous. I mean, that just ties in perfectly to that, yeah. that era of the house. It picks up all the massing and everything, but it has what people need for today. Well, and a big part of what we do, too, is, appro is determining appropriate use of materials. Some, some clients will come to us and like, you know, 10 different elements that they want to see on the front elevation. And it just doesn't fit together. You just can't put so everything you, in your That's water. right. You have to do So you got your, your guidance counselor for no, our historic it. housing reproduction. Very, very much. And, uh, How much does it cost to hire an architect, Jeff? Well, each architect sets a different fee. There's no one set fee that you'll see right. across the board. So the best thing for us is if a client comes to us and has a scope to find or, or knows, um, say, they want us to be involved in the initial design and, and do the construction documents, someone describes a scope, we can give them a fixed fee. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we work. And typically, uh, our fees uh, on a project may run from 5% Five percent to ten percent of construction. Okay, costs. so there's a good range depending on the, the complexity of what you have to do. Exactly. A simpler design might be less money or what mm -hmm. have you. Exactly. Your involvement, but you can turnkey it too, all the way from beginning to end, That's or just right. be involved in the front. Yeah, many clients come to us and want us involved all the way through construction, uh, choosing colors, final wallpaper, and right into moving date. So it depends what a client is looking for. Jeffrey, thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Don't Appreciate be afraid it. of architects; they love you. <laughs> <That's right. laughs>
Well, if restoring or renovating an old house isn't your bag, a reproduction house is definitely the way to go, so don't be afraid of it. Until next time, I'm Bob Yap. about your house? About Your House with Bob Yap was partially underwritten by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. In past places and future spaces, from main streets to back roads, we're helping Americans bring preservation home. The National Trust for Historic Preservation.